I'm Jamie Smart, and in this episode, I'm speaking with my friend and colleague, Dr. Bill Pettit. Dr. Pettit is a board-certified psychiatrist who spent the majority of his career awakening mental health and sharing the understanding that there's just one cause and one cure for mental illness. He met Sidney Banks over 35 years ago and since then has been practicing psychiatry with a renewed level of personal well-being and a previously unappreciated awareness of the spiritual nature of life. And one of the interesting things about Bill is that he sees people's innate mental well-being reawakened despite the labels and diagnoses given to them. So welcome, Bill. Oh, well, thank you, Jamie. It's, it's really nice to be here. And I, you know, you and I have had a pleasant time talking even before we start here and it's been very uh, it's been nice to get to know you better as we've uh, been preparing to do this yeah. yeah same here bill and uh one of the the things i i just think it would be great for people to uh hear from you is yeah. what first sparked your interest in these principles yeah that's a that's a great question jamie and uh you know in a way um I, 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 Keith Blevins used to talk about, he said, you know, I don't know how this happened. I, I'd even forgot to put any bait on my hook and I caught the big one, <laughs> you know, and that was his, his metaphor. And I, I used to laugh at that because I thought, you know, that's true too, because because on April 1st, 1983, when I met Sid, I, I, I think it's just funny that it was April Fool's Day. Mm. I mean, I think that's really funny because here I am, uh, 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 you know, uh, 41 years old, uh, having gone in and out of depression for 21 years. Uh, I've got 26 and a half years of schooling. Um, I've been in psychiatry almost nine years. I was in 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 surgery and family as some training before that. So I'd been out of medical school 14 years. Uh, I'd had over 900 lectures on mental illness and medications in my residency. And I had had no lectures on mental health. And yet they called me a mental health professional. And so I was, I, I had actually left psychiatry and was working in California traveling around the country. And I even did trainings in Japan and Canada with a company, uh, an experiential adult training company. And, um, and I had become national program director of that company. And uh, I had met George Pransky uh, about two months before, and we had talked and I had listened and I didn't know what he, what the hell he was talking about, but I knew, <laughs> I knew that it, he was pointing to truth. You know, if you've been, been waiting at the coffee shop after, after, um, after the first two hour session that he and I talked sometime in March of 83 and would have said, Bill, is this really, is this really a big deal? And I would have said, Jamie, yeah, I think it is, but I have no idea what it is. <laughs> it has something to do with the power of thought. I think mm -hmm. I knew. And, and, uh, but I don't, you know, and I sat for two hours, I understand English, I've, I've got a lot of schooling, I understand the language, and I still don't know what the hell he was talking about. But I, I, I'm curious, and I'm, and I'm going to go to this man, Sidney Banks, on April uh, 1st, uh, that he asked me to come and listen to him, 200 other people, San Francisco. And within, within, so, so how did I get I think I just, I was looking for some relief from the inner tension and pain and intermittent depression that would at times almost immobilize me, Jamie. You know, even when I wasn't depressed, I, uh, depression was like a black cloud that was following me about two steps behind me. And to the degree it, it would metaphorically had a voice, it would say, listen, I know you're getting kind of cocky up there, but I can have your ass any time I want it. Mm. So you better not get too cocky about not being depressed. Because it, it appeared to me that depression came out of the sky and just swooped down and, 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 and I had no choice. 
I had no idea that what I was doing moment to moment with these gifts of mind, thought, and consciousness, and let's just for the for the for the um, sake of the I just we'll just do it to thought. I mean, even though all three are, are working together, it has to be powered by by mind and and then brought to life by consciousness. I had no idea that my spending six to nine hours a day in some form of stressful thinking, worry, guilt, resentment, upset, overanalyzing, unresolved grief, drivenness. I had no idea that I was innocently creating my own depression. Hmm. It appeared to me that it was caused by things external to me, people and things external to me. So in answer to your question, I think I just was, you know, Sid says in, in The Missing Link that we're all seeking enlightenment, whether we know it or not. And, and another way of saying that, I think, is that we're all seeking to come back home from whence we came. We're coming to come back home to the spiritual essence to the place of, of love and, and understanding. I mean, Sid talks about that, 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 that place of love and understanding is, I think we're all trying to, trying to find our way back home. Hmm. You know? And I, so I think in that respect, universal mind is always on the lookout at whatever level of understanding, even though my level of understanding was low, it allowed me to at least hear, uh, George to hear some truth there and to and to not blow him off and 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 instead to say yeah why what do I have to lose I'm in mm -hmm. pain what why would I not why would I not go and listen to this man even though it sounded pretty crazy I mean in my world uh, he's a welder with a ninth grade education he's read four welding books in his <laughs> life and I'm going to go and learn something from him you know, with my 26. And at the same time, I had to have the humility to say, well, wait a minute, <laughs> you're in pain. <laughs> I'm in emotional pain. <laughs> why, why won't I, why, why not go listen? And uh, so I think that that was just that, that, that thread of hope was still there, that there is an answer, you know, and sadly, you and I see every day, like this fellow that we had in California 10 days ago, that went in and started just killing people at random in a bar and, and killed 10 people, 11 people, and then killed a 29 year veteran policeman. He had gotten to the point where he did not experience any hope. He had, he had gotten to the point where he was in unbearable pain and, and his life had no value. He was ready to go, but he was angry mm. and disconnected and angry that nobody had had helped him find a way home. Now that's that's just my editorial, but uh, but so I I feel I feel blessed. I feel incredibly grateful. I really I I I think I could easily have ended up somewhere with a bottle of Jim Beam or some other whiskey uh, after my fifth divorce, uh, and having lost somehow with uh, inappropriate behavior, having lost my medical license. And sitting homeless on a corner with a fifth of Jim Beam saying, why, why did I meet five bitches? Why didn't I meet some nice women? And having no idea that I had had anything to do with my demise. And I think the wonderful thing that's been for me is to see the difference between responsibility and guilt. I saw, I took, I saw responsibility for my depression but I felt no guilt about it. I, I realized that I had truly, and, and that's a whole, maybe a whole topic for a whole hour of psychological innocence, but I truly saw that I had done the very best that I'd known to do each moment of my life, given the level of understanding that I brought to, to life's challenges. And, 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 and it allowed me to take responsibility without having a burden of, 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 the, the burden that comes with, with shame and guilt. You know, I, I, I saw, I saw, I saw the innocence much like I, you know, when I had small children that they would knock something over that I had left in a place that I shouldn't have left, that it wasn't their 
problem that they broke that vase. Mm -hmm. I had a two-year-old and I should have had the house safe from vases being broken because of where they were in their, in their level of understanding and, and, and maturation. Um, anyway, so I, I know I got wordy there, but um, that, that's, that's kind of the answer uh, that I think I just was, I was blessed. I was, I was blessed and I was blessed to be exposed and also blessed to, to have enough, enough hope and enough uh, understanding to listen, you know, to be humble enough to listen. Yeah. And Bill, what happened when you went to that April Fool's Day conference with uh, Sydney Banks? Well, you know, as I sat there, I think it was Friday evening and Saturday and Sunday. I again, at the end, of, at the end of the conference, I, I don't know that I could have told you a whole lot, but I knew that that I was experiencing a feeling inside that was quieter. Mm. Uh, my mind was quiet. My brain was quieter. I, I was less attached to the content. You know, the people in, in, uh, in, uh, they talk about the people that don't relapse from cognitive people, even people that have gotten better with cognitive behavior therapy, the people that don't relapse haven't any less negative thoughts, but they've decentered from the content of their thinking. They don't care if they have negative thoughts. Mm. And as I look back, that started to happen for me. There was, I didn't have any need to fight my thinking. Mm -hmm. I didn't have, even if they were inappropriate sexual thoughts or inappropriate aggressive thoughts, or I became more, I, I became more of an observer. And I, and I, I, not always, you know, but I saw even when I was an angry, angry person, um, angry, I would have seven up to seven to eight hissy fits a day sometimes, Jamie, mm -hmm. because people were people and things were constantly pissing me off. <laughs> and to have and to have some awareness that it started to come to me that I had the piss off machine in my back pocket. And when people didn't do what I wanted <laughs> them to do as quickly and in the way that I wanted them to do it let alone if they did it the opposite, hmm. then I turned on the piss off machine and pissed myself off and blamed it on them. Yeah. Well, that was wild. That was wild to see that. Hmm. It was wild. I, if I can, I remember one time I, I was working at two hospitals and it was just cell phones. It was in the mid eighties. Cell phones had not come out yet, but there were car phones for the hmm. first time. So I would be in my car phone and I'd get a page and, and I remember I, it was early morning. I had to go do a consult at the hospital like 6.30 in the morning and it was only eight o'clock and I had had five conversations with nurses that had not gone well, hmm. that one, where one or both of us had hung up, slammed the phone down in an hour and a half. I'd had five of these. Hmm. And and I, you know, I, my first thought was, here I am in a low mood, and then I have to deal with bitch. <laughs> right? And, and then a, a little thought came into my head, what, which wouldn't have come in the past. And it said, uh, Bill, I'm wondering if you uh, can see that you've had something to do with how these conversations have gone. And, and I, what, me? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I listened and I called every one of those five nurses back up and I apologized. Mm. And then I said, now let me, let me listen to what you were trying to tell me and see if I can be of help. You're there taking care of those patients. I'm riding around in my car mm. and, and you're the one right there. Let me see if I can be of help. And every one of those five conversations w were entirely different. And people, they told me later in person, three or four out of the five said, no doctors ever apologized to me before. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, it, I, don't, I don't say that in proud, I say that in a grateful way that, that the, when you say what, what happened, you know, um, the other thing that happened in my marriage 
my late wife, uh, Sue, and I, who had been married for 31 years, and she died in 2000 of cancer, uh, we had been divorced for three years after 10 years of marriage and had gotten remarried and back together, and we were struggling. We, if we had not met George and, and then Sid Banks, I suspect we would have gotten divorced again. We, we loved each other dearly, Jamie, but we lacked understanding. One time, actually, my, my present wife of 15 years, and she and I were widowed about three years when we met, and I feel so blessed. She's a, a beautiful, magnificent, wonderful woman. And she asked Sid one time, she said, Sid, um, people say that love is 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 curative is love enough and Sid got very quiet and he then quietly said but clearly said he said you know love and understanding is enough and there's no doubt in my mind that my late wife and I before we met Sid we loved each other dearly at the level that we could given our level of constantly stressing ourselves out with our thinking but we didn't have understanding and so we were caught in our own separate realities and reactive to to our thinking and to things that the other one would do and 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 it was very difficult um there's a remake movie right now in the united states i don't know when it gets to britain on uh, called a star is born it's out now it's Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper. And it, I thought they were incredible. The music's incredible. Acting is incredible. And their love for each other is profound. But they lack understanding. Mm. One of them even more than the other. And so tragedy occurs. Mm. I, I watched a movie this last summer. I was coming back from... Um, my my daughter's wedding in, in in South Dakota on the plane and I watched a movie and it was called Thank You for Your Service and it was five veterans of the United States Army who had come back from Iraq and it's based on a true story of five people from a company that all got discharged and they went back to their families and to their fiancés and to their wives and I, as I watched that movie, Sid's words, love plus understanding is enough, hit me at a whole new level. Because I saw that these men had incredible love in their hearts. Hell, they loved each other. I mean, they'd carried each other wounded off the battlefield, regardless of whether the guy weighed 30 pounds more than they did. Mm -hmm. Now, they might give him hell after he recovers in the hospital and tell him, how about losing at least 20 of those pounds so the next time it's a little easier. But they, that was irrelevant. They, they got, came back to wives that they loved, fiancés that they loved, families that they loved, but they did not have understanding. So they were, they, what am I talking about? I'm on talking about not a cognitive intellectual understanding, I'm talking about an insight-based understanding of universal mind that we are spirit, we are a manifestation of divine energy. And our intellect can't wrap around that, but we can have insights into and have brief experiences that that's just fact. And that we, as a result, we have access to a wisdom beyond our intellect 24 seven, if we have the humility to leave our personal mind alone, mm. our rational analytical mind. And these men did not know that, they didn't have that understanding. So they were at the mercy of their painful memories, memories of things they'd witnessed, memories of things they had done, um, and, and, and they were at the mercy of, of their reactive thinking. And, and, it, and it caused chaos and pain. And we still have a, one, one veteran committing suicide in the United States every 22 seconds. Or t is it 22 a day? I don't know. Any, whatever it is, it's, maybe it's 22. A, I think I even saw it's one every 22. Anyway, 
it just, your heart breaks. Mm. You know, we lost 58,000 on the ground in Vietnam. Over 300,000 had committed suicide by 1990. Mm. Five times as many people who died on the battleground. So, love and understanding. Huh? So gradually, I started to see uh, I started to see separate realities. My wife and I, first ten years of our marriage, whenever we disagreed, we argue on to see who was right. And instead, now we started to listen to each other knowing that we truly lived in separate worlds. And this person that I love with my whole heart and soul, what, why would I not try to listen deeply to understand the world that they live in so that my world can get bigger? So that my world can get bigger rather than defending my little world. <laughs> How about me listening so that my world can get bigger? And Bill, for someone who's maybe new to this understanding and yeah. saying, what do you mean we all live in separate realities? How would you, how would you describe that uh, to someone who that's a, a, a brand new way of hearing? Right. Something? Right. Well, the first thing I would do, and you and I know this, um, that I, I, I really encourage people that if they have any interest to go to www.sidbanks.com and to watch Sid's videos mm. you know he refused he had his experience in 1973 when he was 43 years old and he refused to be um i hear i, I just laugh when i hear people say oh it sounds like a cult because sid banks would not even allow himself to be videotaped for 27 years mm -hmm. in in 2000 finally we told him sid you're 70 years old and you're not going to live forever, please. We need some videotapes. He died in 2009. Mm -hmm. Because he had said all those years, I don't want followers. Mm -hmm. I, I, I will talk to clergy. I will talk to educators. I will talk to doctors. I will talk to mental health professionals. I will talk to anybody that's trying to help people have a gentler life of any religion or no religion. I, it's, it's not important to me. But but I don't want followers. And we said, we understand that, Sid, but we need, we need, there's something much more powerful about a video. You know, you and I, when people look at this, it's more powerful than just hearing somebody on the phone. Mm -hmm. And it's not the same as being totally present in their presence, but it's, 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 it's close. And um, so, uh, and I, I lost my track there. It was your, I apologize. Oh, it's okay. I, so I, I can recap. So I had right. asked you uh, for someone who's new to this and right. doesn't okay. know, hasn't heard about separate realities. And you right. made a recommendation, which I would heartily endorse, you know, right. the every, uh, every program I do, every coaching intensive I do, part of that is always with my client or my clients listening right or what listening to or watching Sid's audios or videos, reading the books, and they are just the most, well, and I remember, Bill, I was having a conversation with our mutual friend, Jan Chipman. She, she was saying something similar, you know, li listen, I, she said, I love, I love listening to Sid Banks. And, and then she said something I re that really struck me. She said, you know, the thing that's so, wonderful about listening to Sid. She said, it just makes it easier for me to listen to who I really am. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you mentioned that divine spiritual energy that we're all made of. And it's the way, the way it, it seems to me is that when I, when I listen to Sid's recordings or watch his videos or read his books, it's almost like there's somehow a mirror that's showing me yeah. the truth of who we really are. Brings us back home, doesn't it? Mm. You know, there's something powerful about being in the presence of somebody who is totally present. 
it's hard to stay in your head when you're in in the presence of somebody who's totally present. Right? Yeah. So, um, uh, so I would encourage people to do that uh, and to read Mr. Banks's books and to watch his videos twice through, mm. because you'll have different eyes and ears the second time that you go, go through. And um, but so so the three principles, you know, what I what I started to realize, you know, Sid talks about that that um, and they're a metaphor, you know, they're a metaphor, but he's saying that they're. It's interesting that the idea that there's a what you know what he calls universal mind, and he says you know it's what people call God. That there there were a group of physicists, and and my wife Linda is so well read, she, much better than I, but she told me about this that there a group of forty plus physicists got together twice for a number of days, and I think it was in France, and finally a few years ago they came to a consensus statement that there was a time in the history of the universe as we know it that there was no matter. Mm -hmm. There was only a great nothingness. <laughs> there was only a formless universal energy, intelligent energy. That's what Sid's talking about. Mm. That's all that, and, and that everything, the logic, when I was a kid, Jamie, in a very religious family, and I was told that God was everywhere, frankly, it seemed a little weird. <laughs> there's my glasses, there's the glass, there's this book, there's my mouse, there's the computer, there's my light bulb. But I, now I, I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. Whatever you call that formless energy that was there before form, mm -hmm. anything that now has form has to be made of that energy. If you want to call that Dave, then everything is Dave. I have a couple that doesn't like the word God, so they use the word Dave. I said, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Everything is Dave energy. Mm. I mean, that's what Einstein, when people like even scientists like Einstein said, everything that is in form in this universe is the same energy in a different disguise. Mm. The rock looks pretty damn solid, and yet the physicists tell me it's made up of atoms that have electrons going three-fourths the speed of light mm. around each one of its atoms. E not so quiet, after all. Mm -hmm. So, so... So if we are that energy, I think the difference between me and the glass, as we as human beings, is that we can be aware of what we're made of. Mm -hmm. I don't know that the glass has the gift of consciousness. The glass is a participant in this spiritual theater called life, where formlessness takes form. But I don't know if it's a spectator, as we, we can be spectators. Mm -hmm. We can become aware of what we are and that if we are that then me that means that we have access to that wisdom beyond the intellect and it makes worry and over analysis kind of irrelevant mm -hmm. to the degree that one starts to really know not intellectually but know in your chest that you have access to wisdom a wisdom that will a spiritual energy that's trying to guide you through life every moment of your life through any challenge that you face boy uh i think i think i'll 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 go to that be open to that rather than to go to my rational analytical thinking and wondering why i'm getting more confused and bill for someone who's listening and goes i love the idea that i I'm made of this divine spiritual energy and that it's guiding through me through life. But why does, why would that make worry and over analysis irrelevant? Well, because people who, you know, there's, there's, there's um, six different ways, five or six different ways that I think generally, and you can use thought in an infinite number of ways, but as a clinician, what I've seen is, um, 
that there are about six ways that people 98% of the time take themselves away from their innate, to me, innate inborn state of mental well-being. So mm-hmm. two of them are worry and analysis. Uh, over-analysis. What do, I, what do I mean by over-analysis? I mean, I've got to figure this out. I've got to figure this out. I've got to figure this out. Even though I'm spiraling down into more confusion and my mood is lowering and my tension is rising, all of which are not psychiatric symptoms. They're gifts that tell me that I'm going the wrong way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a whole nother discussion. But so if I really know, you know, it's interesting. Einstein said the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. I think my translation of that would be that that wisdom, when we just know, comes from the source of everything, when he says it's a sacred gift. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The rational analytical mind, it's faithful servant. Wow. Hmm. And yet, he says, however, we have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Carl Jung, who I, I, I'm not a big student of, I mean, I, my, my wife I know is much better read of him, but one of his quotes, the actual quote is that man will never relieve his suffering by his own thinking, Mm -hmm. but only by revelations of a wisdom beyond his intellect. Wow. Yeah. Now, Jung saw I can vouch vouch for that, by the way. (laughs) I'll bet there's a lot of listeners who can vouch for that, too. But you know what's interesting? God love him. He, he must have seen that someday clearly, but then he must have listened to his intellect mm. or he wouldn't have had people go through a thousand hours of Jungian analysis. Mm. It wouldn't have made sense. Mm. <laughs> so, so but, but I think people have pointed out that, so if I really know that, life has gotten much simpler for me because I really... I don't see analysis, the analytical mind as the enemy. I mean, Einstein used it wonderfully in science, but he knew that when he got stuck, that then he would go play the violin, Mm -hmm. a soft music that he loved, or he would go walk in nature and appreciate the beauty in nature, or he would go sailing, which he loved, or he would simply sit on his swing all of which, it's, those aren't techniques, they were to him, but he knew that that was at some level, he knew that was a place that he would get out of his thinking and back into his life. Well, you know, Bill, it, it occurs to me that what we're talking about now relates to, to one of the questions, basically before I, uh, uh, when I knew that we were going to do this interview, sure. I put up on a post on Facebook and invited people to ask questions. Now, in the introduction, I said, uh, um, Bill has spent the majority of his career awakening mental <laughs> health and sharing the understanding that there's just one cause and one cure for mental illness. So this would be a great time to ask, you know, what is the one cause and the one cure as you see it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, for 25 or 30 years, I've been trying to s- point that out, that there's one cause of mental illness. And, and it's gotten clearer and clearer through the years that there's one, the one cause of mental illness is, if I want to take it all the way back, is the lack of understanding of universal mind. And out of that lack of understanding, then people innocently start using this beautiful gift of thought in ways that is unhealthy. And so they get into a state of chronic mental stress. And the reason that that's a problem is a lot of reasons, but uh, even from a physiological level is when we get into chronic mental stress, we activate a system in our body with this called the stress response. 
and we activate a system that was meant to be activated for life-threatening situations. And it was meant to be activated for up to 30 minutes, once every 24 to 72 hours, uh, in, to save our life and to save the lives of others. If anybody's interested in, in the problem, uh, they can read um, uh, Robert Sapolsky's uh, um, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. I mean, yeah. he's, he's brilliant, he's funny, he's incredibly brilliant, and he's just very funny. Mm. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, I saw him live uh, one time with the Dalai Lama in, um, in Washington, D.C., and uh, he's just brilliant. Um, but anyway, um, so, uh, so, so the cause is that people get into a chronic state of mental stress. And what happens is we have been made a lot of psychiatric, what people call psychiatric symptoms. I'm going to suggest, and Tom Kelly and I are in the process of writing an article, and Jack Bransky, writing an article, and we're talking about the fact that that the an antidote to all mental illness is is the U factor, which is understanding, insight derived understanding of what what we're made of and and how we're creating our experience one moment at a time. If we don't know that, it's easy to get to get caught up in in reactive thoughts that come back from our computer brain, because the brain the brain is biological. It, it's a computer. Mm -hmm. If I live in rural Iowa, I'm going to have different stuff in my computer than if I'm in sub-Saharan Africa or Bangladesh or Yemen or Saudi Arabia or you pick any place in the world. Guatemala, I'm going to have different information in my computer. The computer is not the enemy, but it has limited information. Mm. Very limited information. I sometimes, Jamie, I will take a, a, a big uh, white sheet and I'll take a very fine pencil lead and I'll poke it. And I'll say, did everybody see that I poked it? And they said, I said, do you see the dot? And they said, no, we can't see it from here. I said, well, I'm telling you, there's a small dot on there. And I'm going to ask you, imagine that that small dot is a sphere. And we've put a lid over Wembley Stadium. And it's floating around in the middle of Lim Wembley Stadium. And it's the only thing within the stadium. Mm -hmm. The rest of it is all space. Are you with me? Yeah. And I say that little dot that little sphere floating around is a pretty overrepresentation of what Bill Pettit knows <laughs> after 76 and a half years of living and 26 and a half years of formal education compared to what I don't know. Mm -hmm. So when I get into a state of not knowing what to do about something, why would I keep going to that little dot and think that it was going to, the, on the 14th time, give me the answer? Mm -hmm. Why would I not realize that the, that the intelligent energy of all things is at the core of my being? And if I allow my personal intellect to quiet down, I will be given, there's a book up there on your shelf called Clarity. <laughs> I will be given to see clearly with clarity exactly what I need to do next. And we we get caught up in impatience. We if if there was a total blackout in the United States, you know, if that if that volcano in uh, in uh, Yellowstone ever erupts, they say we may have blackness throughout most of the United States for some time. And if I'm trying to get from New York to Los Angeles, 3,000 miles in total darkness, all I need is a good set of headlights that get me the next 100 feet, and then the next 100 feet, mm -hmm. and the next 100 feet, and I can travel 3,000 miles in total darkness. And if I understand that in life, when I'm in darkness, and I allow my mind to quiet enough, I am always given every single time in the last 35 years that I've had the humility to do it, 
I've been given enough light to go the next hundred feet mm-hmm. or the next three feet or the next five feet and then the next five feet. And it makes light has made life more gentle than I ever dreamt. Now, do I forget that sometimes? Of course I do. And you know what? Life starts getting hard. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. We've been given we've been given things like people think that your mood going down and your anxiety going up and your body starting to have pain is a terrible thing. It's not. It's a signal to me. It's information. It's alarm system letting me know that I am innocently giving light, life to paying attention to thoughts that I don't, it's not healthy for me to give attention to. And, and if I really start to trust, I tell people when I'm upset, I used to think it was the time that I was really on to something. <laughs> it was the time for me to think more, to talk more, and to act more. Yeah. And I wondered why my life was constantly cleaning up messes, mm-hmm. relationship messes, all kinds of messes. So when I am upset now, the metaphor to me is I am now five feet underwater with a three foot snorkel. <laughs> and I ask people, Jamie, what percentage of the time, if I take a deep breath, will things get really bad and worse? Mm-hmm. And they say a hundred percent. I say, yeah. I said, hell, if it was 60, 40, I might go for it every once in a while, mm-hmm. just if I felt lucky, but it's not, it's a hundred percent. As my good friend Beverly Wilson says, when you're not in your right mind, and the only way you can get there is via your innocent misuse of thought, she said, it's real simple. You're stupid. Mm -hmm. So keep your mouth shut. Keep your hands to yourself. Don't throw anything. Don't hit anything. Don't hit anybody. And number three, leave your thinking alone until you feel better. And before you know it, you'll be back in your right mind. Mm -hmm. And people want to make it more complicated than that. And it's not. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful, Bill. And what, what I heard you pointing to there is something you mentioned earlier, that, that those things like uh, stress or, you know, the various symptoms of excess right. stress, that those are actually gifts. Will you say a little more about that? Of course. You know, of course. Um, I tell people, if you're, if you're driving along, well, panic attack is a perfect example, mm. okay? When, when I tell people that their panic attacks are uh, a gift that they've been given, they look at me like, you know, they'd like to hit me, but, but, they, but they've gotten enough rapport and respect that they don't, right? Mm. But they look kind of, they say, okay, doc, you know, you've got to help me with this one. And I say, oh, okay. I say, here's the way our body's made. It has all sorts of alarm systems. When, when very briefly first, when you and I uh, get caught up in negative thinking, first of all, let, let me, uh, do you know the far side cartoons? Sure. Yeah, remember the far side? I loved them, right? But there was one that I often cite, and, and there's a reason for it, because if you take it literally, it's not funny at all. It's tragic. But these two guys in the 747, they're piloting the 747, and they're looking out through the front of their plane, and they see a mountain goat. And one of them says, boy, you usually don't see a mountain goat up this high. Well, that's two seconds before they hit the mountain. Yeah. Crash. Now, the reason I, that that's both funny and informative to me is that before I understood the principles, Jamie, I did not know that I was off, tr- off path, glide path, until I crashed into the mountain. Mm. Until I destroyed a relationship, until I did something way out of my moral, moral uh, grounding, mm. until I made a rash, impulsive decision that caused problems for me and others. I, I didn't realize it. And... So I didn't realize that we have been given all sorts of information that let us know when we start to get off glide path. Mm. 
Mm. So we don't suddenly realize it when we see the mountain goat too late. Mm. What happens? Mood wise, what happens is our mood starts going down. We start feeling more depressed. And there's all kinds of things that physiologically, you know, uh, that we're responding to. And then we f start to feel irritable. Now we're in the, and then eventually we start to get disconnected. If we go down far enough, we feel disconnected from everybody. And, and that person is angry and depressed and disconnected is the person that can walk into a theater, a school or a bar with a whole bunch of guns and start killing people because mm -hmm. they're in so much pain that they that they're looking for relief and they're ready to die and they're going to take some people with them. Most thank thank God most people don't get to that point, but mm -hmm. sadly too many people do. In the area of tension, we get uh, we start feeling anxiety. If we continue to to create anxiety, and we're creating so much, they've shown from MRI studies and PET scan studies that in three minutes of voluntary upsetting thinking, people create a very measurable biochemical dysregulation in their brain. And what they've done is they've activated, in, in 90 seconds, they've activated the, the alarm system, the stress response of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Mm -hmm. It has massive hormones, glucose, adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, uh, knocks out the immune system 40 to 70 percent, knocks out the growth system, knock, tremendously knocks down the sex hormones. Why? Because if our ancestor is facing a saber-toothed tiger with nothing but a wooden club, if that eats him, he's not going to need to f worry about cancer or infection. He's not worry about growing anymore, and he's not going to worry about having an erection because <laughs> he's going to be dead. Mm. So all of those resources are poured into this emergency system, which has allowed people to save themselves and others' lives, either by action or inaction, by quiet, both. There's 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 studies of of um, women that have stumbled. Back. I mean, there's instances where it reports of women that have stumbled back into cars after a bad accident and, and realized that their child was in the back seat in a seat and somehow gotten them all disconnected and stumbled to safety and handed their baby off only then to feel excruciating pain and realize they had bones sticking out of both mm. their arms because of that system. But that system was not meant to be activated worrying about a layoff at the plant my mom's breast cancer, my dad's alcoholism, or my grandson's cocaine habit. And yet innocently people do that if they don't understand that they have access to something that, first of all, that we don't have control over a lot of things in our life. <laughs> but the, the best way we can be of, of, is to know what we can do is to be in a healthy state of mind. Mm -hmm. um, so let me go back. I apologize. I get diversing off and I, and I, I lose your question. Um, uh, the question was, and, you, and you're answering it beautifully, Bill, and you're setting the, setting the scene for it. So it's totally fine. I had made the point that you make the, the assertion that there's one cause and one cure for mental illness. And uh, so you were talking about the stress system and everything right. was being discussed. Oh, we we're talking about panic attacks. Yeah. Yeah. You said, why is there a gift? So, so if we, if we are, the, I've probably treated 8,000, 7 to 8,000 people with panic attacks. And the question I ask them is the following. In the two to three hours prior to your panic attack, was there a minimum of 20 to 30 minutes where you were actively stewing, stressing, or fighting upsetting thoughts? The score right now is 7,998 to 2. <laughs> I'm not going to ask those two people to take a lie detector test. Uh, I don't think they're lying. I think they just don't realize. It's you know? not aware of it. Right, not aware of it. So, <clears throat> so, so, so here I am. I've been stewing about something, one of my kids or some uncertainty in my life, and I start to feel uneasy. So I, 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 I stop doing it. After, I've been doing it for 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I go in and I turn on the soccer match, my favorite team, whatever it is, Manchester, whatever. And I'm watching it, and suddenly, 
I, I'm short of breath. My, my heart's beating out of my chest. I feel kind of lightheaded. I, I'm, I'm, I'm shaking. I'm, I'm, I'm sweating. I'm, I'm having hot flashes. I'm having cold flashes. And I go to my brain and I go, brain, wh wh what the hell's going on? And the brain says, listen, Bill, I'm not real sure, but I'm thinking you may be having a heart attack. Hmm. Heart attack? Holy crap! At which time, I, more noradrenaline more my my symptoms get worse and i go brain what's happening now and brain says listen i i'm going to whisper this because i don't want to frighten you i think you're dying <laughs> dying holy <laughs> crap now <laughs> so here's the deal about panic attacks they're a gift mm. given to us to try to wake us up to what we're innocently doing because we're creating more biochemical dysregulation then our body can handle easily. And it's going to have to even start doing what they call epigenetic changes. It's going to have to change which genes are on because only 5,000 of our 25,000 genes are active at any time. And in a healthy, peaceful, loving state of mind, the 5,000 the 5, most efficient are, are, up, are on. But if you start causing problems, then the body has to go to backup systems to deal with that regulation. Mm -hmm. So people say, here's my metaphor for a panic attack. I say, if you're driving down a county ro road in England and you start to get sleepy and you're drowsy and you start to head and you're gonna head for the ditch. I mean, you could flip over and there's water there. You could drown, maybe you and your occupants in your car. But fortunately, they have put on the side of the county road those rumble strips, right? If, yeah. And you hit the rumble strip and you're... I said, what does the rumble strip do? They said, well, it wakes you up. Hmm. And you do what? You get back on the road. A panic attack is the rumble strip. It's your friend. Hmm. It's trying to wake you up. It's interesting. People say, well, why would, why would whoever, what universal mind make something that lasts for three hours? Well, it's meant to last four minutes. Mm. A panic attack is made to last four minutes because, and this is simplifying the physiology, but, but it's to its core, norepinephrine and epinephrine, the half-life is one minute. So what does that mean? That means in one minute, there's only 50% left. In two minutes, only half of that, 25%. Mm -hmm. In three minutes, 12%. Four minutes, 6%. Five minutes, 3% left. Yeah. The only way that it can last longer than four minutes is if I get frightened by the experience. And that's what happens, Jamie, with people that get chronic fatigue syndrome or depression is people start to have alarm systems that go off to try to let them know that they're innocently using this, these powers and they don't have the courage or the level of understanding to leave their thinking alone and access that intelligent energy that they are. Mm -hmm. They keep going to their personal intellect, to that little dot to try to figure it out. And so they keep taking themselves into more and more stress and more and more outbursts of norepinephrine. And so panic, there are people that have killed themselves because of the panic attacks being so frightening and so unbearable. And people that don't know, I know people that have been to emergency rooms 50 times thinking they were having a heart attack. And if people don't know that it's an alarm system and that it's their friend, they don't know to allow their mind to quiet. They don't have the courage and the faith to do that. But people that know that, they, I've had so many people say, you can't tell me you, the first time that I said, why don't I listen to the fat old psychiatrist and just leave him my thinking alone for four minutes and see what happens. And lo and behold, and the same thing, by the way, with hallucinations. I've had many people, because all hallucinations are, whether they're visual or auditory, are thoughts with special effects. That's all they are. You, we can't experience anything other than a thought. 
Jamie. Yeah. From birth to death, we are experiencing life one thought at a time. And once people know that, even I've had people with diagnoses of schizophrenia that when they had their hallucinations or when they had frightening voices telling them to kill themselves or to kill others or whatever, or visual, they, that they learn to leave them alone within at the most 15 or 20 minutes. Oftentimes within four or five minutes, they're gone yeah. because they have no, they're not being given any, they're, they're, it's like people squirting fire into a, into a fire starter, into a thing of coals and they wonder why it keeps flashing up and yeah, and they innocently were doing that and they didn't know that. Mm. That's powerful. That's so powerful. And I've had, and, and the labels that people are given are descriptions of where a person is. It has nothing to do with who a person is. And I will say that even to personality disorders. People think that there's such a thing as a personality disorder. All it is is a human being who's gotten stuck at a certain level of understanding. And so they have habitual ways of dealing with life's challenges mm -hmm. that you can predict if you watch them long enough. Some people withdraw and avoid. Some people strike out and get aggressive. Some people get paranoid, boom, 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 boom. But if I'm having three panic attacks a day and you're the psychiatrist, I have no problem with you labeling that I have a panic disorder. Because I do. But it's not who I am. It's just how, where I am in my level of understanding is manifesting. And so the one cause of mental illness, uh, chronic mental stress, manifests in all these different ways, just depending on, uh, just depending on our individual makeup, presumably. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think we're all, we all have alarm systems that are louder. You know, that even, even like if you read, uh, uh, um, if you read um, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, mm -hmm. there's, there's some truth that people have some systems that are more sensitive. Like, like the skin is a very sensitive system. People will get itching or they'll get psoriasis or they'll get breakouts of hives or they'll, you know, it's the largest organ in our body. Mm. But some people, their skin is not quite as sensitive. They get migraines. Mm. Other people don't get migraines. They've never had a headache in their life, but they've had terrible problems with irritable bowel syndrome and stomach mm. problems. And other people will have other, you know, they'll, it'd be muscle tightness and diffuse pain. They're showing that even this whole thing with chronic pain, that, that, that there's a, an article that I just read it talks about the chronic pain in PTSD, in uh, depression, in all these things, because when people get into a chronic state of dysregulation of the uh, stress system, the HPA axis, it affects the microbiota, the microbes in the gut, which have, there's a feedback loop that goes back to the brain and it actually lowers people, people's um, pain threshold. Mm -hmm. So people start dif experiencing diffuse pain at levels of input that that healthy people do. People when they're in a healthy state of mind don't feel pain. Mm -hmm. So the pain is again, it's an alarm system trying to wake us up. It's a gift. Mm -hmm. But if I don't know it's a gift, I get more concerned about it. Oh no, I've got pain now on top of everything else. And then, of course, they start having sleep disturbance because they're chronically activating the stress response. And then they get worried about that. And now they're starting to, to misplace their keys and their, and their cell phone. And they say, oh, my memory's going. <laughs> and, they, and they don't see that innocently. I've been there. We've all been there. Even suicidal thoughts. I tell people they're your friends. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't do that until I've got sufficient rapport for them to say, tell me about that, doctor. I said, well, when you think about it, 
the suicidal thought is telling me that the computer is saying, have you noticed how bad things you're feeling? Because it tells me what I've been doing with my power of thought, which thoughts I've been giving life to. I've been given life to so much negative thinking that I've lowered my mood and raised my tension and dysregulated the physiology in my body so that I both physically, mentally, and emotionally are experiencing so much dis-ease, mm -hmm. kind of a play on the word dis-ease, so much dis-ease and tension that it fe it's gotten to feel unbearable. Mm -hmm. I can't stand this much longer. And so the computer says, pretty bad, isn't it? It's terrible. And the computer says, do you see any sign that it's going to get better? And if I'm at a certain level of understanding, I say, no, all I see that it's gonna get worse. I've, the computer says, I have a solution, mm -hmm. is suicide. So suicidal thoughts are just telling me what I've been doing with my, this power of thought, whether I've been, had, a, had the courage to leave my low mood thinking alone. Mm -hmm. People ask about bipolar. I don't need to jump there unless you want me to, but I will, because that's become a real area for, for me that of interest. Well, Bill, actually, there were when I put this out on uh, Facebook to our community, there were a number of questions about uh, depression. So what I thought I'd do is, sure. uh, is read all the questions, because I'm guessing that your answer will speak to them. So, Bill, you... I started out uh, by saying that uh, your your assertion that there's one cause and one cure for mental illness, we've been talking about the causes, chronic mental stress. Uh, the one cure, you've actually said it in various different ways, 20 or 30 times. But for anyone who's sitting there going, okay, so what's the one cure? What's right. the one cure? Well, I'll say, I'll say the words and then I'm going to try to quiet down and because if you know if you've, you 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 if you listen to Jan Chipman or Elsie Spittle, you don't. It's not just that you say what they said makes sense. You feel it, and if people hear me, and they say, "Oh, well, that makes sense," and they and they're just hearing because of the way I'm saying it, the logic of it, intellectually, but it doesn't touch them then I'm, I'm not too sure how much power it's going to have. But so I'm going to try to, if I sound a little quieter, it's just that I want to, I want to, to speak from the place that I know that it's true, what is true. And um, so the, the simple answer is, is a level of understanding, an insight based level of understanding where I know that I am made of universal divine energy and that I have wisdom beyond the intellect available to me at all times and that I am every moment of my life, I have a second chance. Every moment I can't do, the past does not exist. Future does not exist. The only thing I have every moment is right now. And to the degree that I can be in the present moment with a clear mind, I, I'm going to be guided. Uh, I'm going to be guided. And I, 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 I'm, going to, I'm going to address later things like traumatic brain injury and dementia, because people always have questions and even schizophrenia. But I'd like to start with that saying that that's the answer, that it's a, that it's a deep level of understanding of our spiritual nature and the resources that we have available to us as a result. And number two, that we are creating our experience from the inside out. It's not, it's not created <coughs> by what other people say and do. It's not created by circumstances. You know, I love, I, I am embarrassed, Jamie, that it took me as a psychiatrist, especially to be 75 years old before I read Viktor Frankl's Pen's Search for Meaning. <laughs> but I did. I read it. And of course, the first 110 pages or so are about his three 
plus years in the German death camp. Mm -hmm. And he left there, you would think by all this, all this stuff about trauma, and I don't in any way need to, to lessen some people's experiences of torture, of et cetera, but I don't also want to take away that we are given within us everything to heal from anything. Mm -hmm. And I have not met a person yet who experienced that they were, quote, traumatized, that wanted to die or live out the rest of their life righteously miserable. Mm -hmm. I haven't met that person yet. I've met people that didn't, at the present moment, see an alternative that they could find peace, but I've never met anybody that didn't want that peace. Hmm. And Viktor Frankl, even in this death camp, he said he had mo mom moments that sometimes were for hours in the most direst of conditions that he lived in a beautiful, beautiful feeling hmm. of love and gratitude. And, and he said, uh, between the stimulus and the response, there is a space. And it is in that space that our freedom lies. And I think as people understand the principles, it is in that space that our freedom lies to remember who we are, what we're made of and what we have accessible to us. And I think that space gets bigger and more accessible as people see have insight based understanding of the principles. And so here's this man that you'd think would die early, 20 years earlier because of his experience. And instead he lives to be 92 and he writes 16 books. Hmm. What's up with that? As Kathy Casey would say, what's up with that? You know. And it's not a should, it's not a, I always tell people, it, I, please don't hear anything I say as a should. Mm -hmm. Hear it as possibility. Hear it as what's possible. Mm -hmm. These three principles are not prescriptive. They're not telling anybody how to live their life. They're telling people how it works and what they're made of so that they can choose more freely how they experience their life and not be at the mercy of other forces. So I'm going to start in answering your question by sharing the quote that I shared with you earlier today, yeah. because I think we both got a good laugh and I got a good laugh. This, this article has been lying around for over a month in my home uh, to about six weeks. And the article is all for one and one for all, mental disorders in one dimension. And here's what this, this is what I, I told uh, Jamie that, I told you that it really brings them, you know, in, in movies like uh, 007 and uh, Mission Impossible movies, the, he, their people are always jumping from one building to another. Mm -hmm. And the good guy makes it, and sometimes the bad guy makes it, sometimes he doesn't. But... When, when I have talked for 25 years, and I'm not the only one, but when I have tried to tell people there is one cause of mental illness of all diagnostic diagnoses in the DSM-5 or the ICD-10, soon the ICD-11, people have looked at me like I was speaking of a Greek, Greek or some foreign mm -hmm. language because it, 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 it was like the buildings were too far apart. Mm -hmm. They'd say, wait a minute, there's 500 diagnoses. Don't you know that? Mm -hmm. And, and this, this article brings the buildings closer together. So that Tom, Kel that we're in the process of trying to write an article that I hope we will get well enough to get published that will start a dialogue, not only nationally, but internationally. Start a dialogue. Because here's what they see, but... They said in both child and adult psychiatry, and these are two researchers, one from King's College in London and the other from Duke University in the United States, and the article has 131 references. In both child and adult psychiatry, 
imperial evidence has now accrued to suggest that a single dimension is able to measure a person's liability to mental disorder, comorbidity among disorders, persistence of disorders over time, and severity of symptoms. Mm. Wow. They're saying there's one cause mm. of all symptoms which should then get categorized into disorders, and those are divided up between internalizing disorders, anxiety, mood, externalizing disorders, eating disorders, gambling, drugs and alcohol, and thought disorders, mm -hmm. getting lost in delusional thinking, and okay? And then you've got the whole thing of physical disorders from chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. So they call this factor P. And I called Tom Kelly, my friend, I think immediately or within 24 hours. And then I went to, and, and he got excited. And then I went to bed that night and I woke up the next morning and I hadn't been thinking a lot of, I've learned to live more and more in a quieter mind. Mm -hmm. And what came to me, Jamie, is that this factor P that they're talking about metaphorically is like darkness. Mm -hmm. Darkness is not really a thing. It's the absence of light. Mm -hmm. Darkness is the absence of light. And all you need is a few photons of light for the darkness to start to dissipate. Mm -hmm. Sid used to say, it doesn't take much. Don't think that you don't know enough to teach. Teach what you know. Point to what you see, and you'd be surprised how even a little bit can turn people's lives around. Bill, you've just reminded me of something I heard very, very recently. And uh, it was a, um, a discussion about some... Uh, studies they conducted, research they conducted with psychedelics many, many years ago. And they had people who were very entrenched, habitual, lifelong smokers. Right. And they gave them three doses of psilocybin. And they found that 80% of them stopped smoking. And right. a year later, 60% of them had still, had not relapsed. But here's the interesting thing. They said that for the, the 80%, uh, sorry, the 60% the for whom it worked, when they took the psilocybin, they had a spiritual experience. And that even though that spiritual experience only showed up for a short period of time, that was enough for them to see that to kind of fall out of their ideas about them, to have, to have a an increase in level of consciousness. And that was enough. And I, you, when you talked about it just takes a few photons of light to, to start dissipating the darkness, that just, a, just awakening to the spiritual nature of life, even if it's just a glimpse, is enough. It's often enough. And, you know, um, I think that the principles to me, people that, pointing to the principles might save people from having to take psilocybin or some, you know, I mean, they're actually doing research in the United States for that with PTSD and stuff, but mm -hmm. because why, what does it do? What is it? How does it allow the spiritual experience? It, the first thing it does is it disassociates people from their, from their intellect, from mm -hmm. their, their thought system. That same thing with, with ketamine, which we could talk at length that is being used now where, for nasal ketidine mean in, in emergency rooms for suicidal people because mm -hmm. it, it disassociates people from their thinking. It's a dissociative. And it also affects the mu, the mu opioid. It, it affects the opioid system. And so that there's obviously concern about that too, but it does, it does dissociate, dis separates people from the grip of their, of their thought system for at least a moment. Mm -hmm. So, so the P factor 
So the P factor to me is like darkness. And so what's the light? What's the photons? The light is, is an increasing level of U, what we're calling the capital U factor. Mm -hmm. the, that not just U with a small U, which would be intellectual understanding, but insight-based understanding of, of the three principles or even just, I mean, Sid, if pressed, would say there's really one principle. It's universal mind, but it's just easier to talk about how it functions, how it works, if you think of it in terms of universal mind, universal thought, universal consciousness. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the answer is, is increments, in, incremental increases in, in understanding of our spiritual nature and the inside out nature of life that we're experiencing thought, life, we're creating a movie. Everybody's walking around so what is it? Over 7 billion people and everybody's making a different movie. Mm. And everybody thinks that their movie is the correct movie. <laughs> and it's a joke. It, huh? <laughs> uh, and Bill, one of the questions that uh, has been asked is, uh, is there any uh, condition that this hasn't worked for? And, and, I don't mean any person, because obviously any individual is going to be on whatever their journey is. But is there any kind of category of mental health uh, diagnosis that has proved to be unresponsive to insight into the, into the nature of who we really are and how our minds work? That's a good question. Um, do I think that I have uh, addre addressed every diagnoses in the not not necessarily but when you look at them in in uh pe certainly many many people with depression mm. uh, many many people with severe in incapacity if people listen to those those i think you listen to a number of them those podcasts that are on the real change portal mm. uh www.realchange.info uh did 13 one-hour podcasts that i actually uh, even with the knowledge I've had over the years, I did three to 10 hours of research before I did every one of those podcasts. Those are fantastic episodes, and I highly recommend everyone listening to go and check those out. So if you just say the, real, uh, the URL again, Bill. Uh, it's www.realchange.info. Yeah. It's uh, Elizabeth Lovius, and, and it has it has a research. It has the peer-reviewed articles. It has many testimonials. It uh, has podcasts by other people, Jackie Hollows, I know, and her work up in the prisons in Scotland and Northern England. Um, uh, there's a lot on there. I haven't looked recently, but there's a lot. I think we, we did 13. I did 13 one-hour podcasts, I believe. Well, your podcasts there that I've listened to, and I think I've listened to uh, all of them. Uh, it's a terrific body of work. So uh, thanks for making those, Bill. So let me go through some of the main categories. First of all, uh, depression. I, all I'll say is that many, many people, once they stopped, you know, they, 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 their depression, mental health rears its... I tell people, if you, if you don't work really hard, mental health will rear its ugly head. Mm. You know, it'll pop to the surface because it's it's like a cork. It's always trying to get to the surface. Mm. It takes a lot of energy to wait to keep it underwater. Mm. Uh, anxiety disorders, of course, anxiety starts to dissipate uh, as people see psychological innocence, and that's a whole nother podcast. But as people see that, truly see it, resentment from past things that people have done to them hurtful that they experience as hurtful, it melts away. People see the innocence and the ignorance of that. And they see that only hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. Nobody hurts anybody when they're feeling full of joy and love. Mm -hmm. So, so it, psychological innocence takes away um, resentment and guilt, just like really seeing universal mind uh, and our spiritual nature takes away worry and over analysis and seeing that we came from spirit and we will return to spirit and there's nothing fearful about death, it loses, the, death loses its sting or its fear. Now, I'm not saying that if I lose one of my children this afternoon in the car vehicle, that I'm not going to have to say, you've got to help me with this. But I also know that I'm going to be given everything I need to go through that 
and to return to a state of well-being with grace. And there's no shoulds about that. There's no time expectations. I know that I will be taken care of. And so then I don't walk around in fear of what's going to happen next. Okay. So um, uh, eating disorders, gambling disorders, uh, drug and alcohol addictions, those are all responses to pain, mm -hmm. to internal pain. Even externalizing or disorders like hoarding and, and uh, OCD, the, the DSM-5, they realize that those are not anxiety disorders. That OCD is ch counting, checking, washing is not an anxiety disorder. It's an attempt to relieve the anxiety mm. that they're creating via their thinking. Mm. So that counting 100 time, oh, to 100 over 3,000 times a day is just an effort to try to distract themselves from the anxiety that they've created with their thinking. Mm. And that, that can disappear. I had one lady that said she was 38 years old. And she said, doctor, when I saw you, I had 11 diagnoses and was on eight medicines. And now I'm on no medicines and I have no diagnoses except mental well-being. And I love my children and I love my husband at levels that I never, never thought possible. And all that happened is that the U factor incrementally increased as she looked in that direction and read Mr. Banks' books and read, read, watched his videos and, and was guided when to do it and when not to. And, and um, so uh, even, even dementia... I, I know a, a, a dementia, two things about dementia. I, there are some people that when they get demented, if they've been angry and bitter their whole life, sometimes they're still angry and bitter in their dementia and they can be dangerous. They can, they can be violent. But the, my, I had a friend whose mother-in-law uh, got severe dementia and she had been one of the most loving people I ever met in my life. And she uh, hallucinated, but she hallucinated giant flowers hmm. and the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> they weren't threatening. And, and, and she would be, she'd play jokes with her husband. She'd play hide and seek. She'd hmm. hide from him and see if you could find him. And one time, they'd been married over 60 years, Jamie, and she said, she, she said you might have heard this on the video, she said to him, he said to her, Betty, what's my name? She said, oh, you know that's not what's important. Hmm. Wow. Now, to me, she's still got mental well-being. Her computer is not working well. Hmm. She's not her computer. I met many people in the, in the in South Dakota uh, Hospital for the Developmentally Disabled, we used to call mentally retarded and autism, many of them that had a high degree of mental well-being. Hmm but they weren't able, because of their problems with their computer, they weren't able to function independently. Mm. But they, they, and they, they, like all of us, other times they got caught up in their thinking and they got depressed mm. and they got reactive and more reactive or whatever. But you started seeing, and I had somebody who had been around the principles a long time after I did that lecture on dementia. She said, my father got severe Alzheimer's and my mother, after he died, said the last two years of his life were the most intimate years of their marriage. Because he, once he got demented, he was constantly not in the past, angry and upset and bitterly talking about and focusing on things that had happened years ago. So if you see even that dementia gave them two years of intimacy. Mm, wow. The I see universal mind as respecting that we have free will and we can pay attention to whatever thoughts we want to, but within that, trying to do the best it can to guide us to a place of peace. Mania. What about mania? In the last three years now, four years, I've asked anybody that's ever had a manic episode or a, a hypomanic episode, do you remember what your thinking was like prior to your manic episode or your hypomanic episode onset? And every one of them that could remember 
but about 75 to 80 percent could said yes i do suicide was becoming a genuine option one of them said that i remember the last thought i had and he went into a full-blown mania and he he i was going to kill my wife who i love dearly and my two sons nine and eleven that i love dearly because i had failed them financially and I didn't want them to suffer after I was gone like I was. And his mania saved four people's lives, Jamie. And it also got him help. Mm. It got, in the United States, we, we, the cavalry got involved. Mm. Because if you're running around with no clothes on or starting fires in the middle of the highway, you get attention. Yeah. So I would say universal mind is always trying to wake us up or if we can't get awake, at least get us to some place where we might have a chance of getting injected with a little more U factor mm. <laughs> and get, have less darkness and more light. Mm. So I see all of those things, even people with traumatic brain injury, I've seen people that have gotten to a level of peace where they're not frightened by their experience. Hmm. I could tell you a man that had a massive stroke and affected his expressive aphasia where he couldn't talk. And this was in 1984 when I was learning with Roger Mills. And he had a massive, he, would, he had been an ambassador to, to Brazil and I tr he couldn't, he, every six or eight words, he, he, he would he get frozen, he couldn't talk. And I talked to him for three days. This is in 1984. There were no books, there were no videotapes. I had whatever I'd gleaned from what Sid had told me and what people that he taught had told me. And he said, I don't think I've learned anything in broken words. I came back on Monday, maybe you've heard this, and he was talking fluently for 40 to 50 words at a time. And he wouldn't get upset when he gets stuck. He would just wait for me in the context to guess the word. And then he would continue. There was a call. Mm -hmm. And finally, I said, Jose, I said, something powerful. What happened over the weekend? And he said, doctor, my daughter and I had not spoken for 28 years after an argument. And she was out in Colorado. And she heard that I had had a massive stroke. And so she called me. And she started sobbing and saying, Daddy, I've been such a fool. And my heart was touched. And I said, no, no, I've been such a fool. The parent is the one that's supposed to teach the children and have humility, not expect the child to have that. It is I that was a fool. And they talked and laughed and loved for 30 minutes on the phone. And when he hung up, he realized, Jamie, he had not searched for one word. Wow. He still had a massive, massive, covered all of Broca's area. But they teach in, in neuropsychology that the brain has many other pathways. Mm -hmm. We just don't use them. There's a way to get around the flooded out road. Mm -hmm. But in a stress state of mind, we don't use them. Mm -hmm. But he did in the state of love and understanding. There are a couple of questions that seem to be connected, uh, and yeah. I'd love to ask you these. There was, I'll ask you both of them. So one of them was, can food and hormones affect mental health? And then the other one was, I'd love to know Bill's view on antidepressants, side effects, and coming off them. Okay. And so it, it's kind of that thing about other substances, internal right. chemical regulation, and that sort of thing. Right. Well, let me do the food and the hormones. Um, if we're not eating healthily, some people are in tune enough to their body that, that they're aware. Hmm. You know, I, I know a, a couple of people that just, uh, in the principles that they just, they're just really in tune with that. So they, they, they just listen. They're aware. Um, it doesn't affect your mental health, but it affects your, it affects your 
physical sensations and that have to, you know, it's interesting. You can't experience anything through your senses directly. It has to be through thought. Mm. Now, when Sid first said that, I, as a physician, I really questioned that in my mind. You know, it seems like when I put my hand on a hot stove, that that pain is 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 more than thought. Mm. But but it, it, it what I realize now it it is. I think this is. I think this is is okay if I go here with this. Uh, sure. I think this is because. I think it's confusing to people, but uh, you can't experience uh, pain without thinking it. And I'll give you some examples in in, uh, in real life. That's why in some in some societies and in countries more than others cultures, people they can actually do cesarean sections under hypnosis. Mm-hmm. Now you're taking a scalpel and you're cutting through a woman's abdomen all the way through the skin, the fascia, all the muscles into the peritoneum. Then you're taking her uterus and you're cutting it open and you're taking the baby out and then you're sewing that all up. (laughs) And the person is fully awake under Mm -hmm. hypnosis. Now that would not be possible except of the ability of some people to, with assistance, have their thoughts so somewhere else that they are not thinking pain since the sensations that are coming up to their cerebral cortex, they're not thinking them. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes total sense. Now, the same- you, And you're not saying, uh, not that it's not, uh, that someone who's in pain is, if that is, uh, they're just thinking painful thoughts. You're talking a technical description of it. Well, I'm saying that, you know, when people say, the doctor said it's in my head, it's the only place pain can be. Sure. And, and it's, it's not that, you, you, you know, you can willfully, will yourself not to experience it. It's giving you information. And let's say, uh, and I'll give you a, another dramatic example in a couple of different ways. If somebody has cancer, and they have a cancer that's eroding on the nerves to the degree that no matter amount of pain medicines to dull the pain to make it bearable is is close to putting the person to killing the person. It would almost take an Mm -hmm. amount of pain pills to get relief, substantial relief from the pain would kill the person and put them in the coma, okay? Well, one of the things that they do in some, in some, uh, in some situations, is they have the neurosurgeon go in and he cuts the fibers from the thalamus, which has accrued all the pain messages. He cuts the, th- the, the connections from the thalamus to the cerebral cortex so that person can no longer think their pain. Mm. So they no longer have pain. Now that's wild mm-hmm. that Sid, this man with uneducated, quote, uneducated man, he knew things. He's, there's things throughout his books that speak to things that have only been discovered. It's kind of like Einstein's theory of relativity. Some things are only being discovered two and three years ago and been proven, mm-hmm. right, by things that have come. And it's the same way with Sid. If There's things in his book that have only been shown to be the way it is physiologically in the last five to 10 years. Mm. Now, another one would be, um, as we said, the lady in the car accident that, that, that doesn't experience pain until she gets her son to safety because that's not where her thinking is. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can tell you from my own little limited ex- experience, when, we, when I played football in high school, if we lost the game at my level of understanding i felt every bruise on my body my whole body hurt Mm -hmm. now if we won the game i could have a hairline fracture of a bone in my forearm and not realize it until i woke up the next morning Mm -hmm. okay i watched my father he came down to live with us 
and he was in incredible joint pain and in joints. And I, I'm sure part of it was that his given up his productive life and next stage of his life and all, whatever thoughts he had about that. He had all this joint pain. He was always taking his Darvons. They weren't, you know, uh, Oxycontins or anything, but they were Darvons for his joint pain. Mm -hmm. Well, then he falls in love with my two little girls who are now 32 and 33, but they were 18 months and three years at the time. And the next thing I know, he's crawling around on his hands and knees, growling and chasing them all over the house. Wait a minute. Where's the joint pain? Mm. Arthritis. He and he admitted to me that, gosh, I, for some reason I'm not having to take my, very rarely have to take my pain pills for my mm. arthritis. Now, his sister, who happened to be a Catholic nun, she was a wonderful lady and a fun, fun, fun lady. Sister Liam, which she named she Liam is is Gaelic Gaelic for William, huh? Uh -huh. She named herself after my father because. He was the oldest brother, and she had tremendous respect for him, and especially after their father had died. And so she got cancer, and he, because of his diabetes, was going to be unable to go visit her before she died. Yeah. Uh, am I surprised that his arthritis joint pain started flaring up, and he started having tremendous pain in his joints again? Hmm as he dealt with the thoughts about both the loss of his sister who he loved and his inability to even go and say goodbye to her last time in person. And of course, in 1986, we did not have uh, Zoom. We can, you couldn't do this, what you and I are doing. The best you could do was talk on the phone. So, so, um, so all I'll say is about food and about hormones is that we still only think, we only experience life one thought at a time. That doesn't change. Mm. So the only thing that really can, in the end, directly affect our mental well-being is our level of understanding. Mm. That's all. It's the only thing. To me. I mean, I'm just saying it as I see it. Sure. Um, but... Do, do I think that if, if we're not eating unhealthily, that, that our body will try to give us signals that we're eating unhealthily <laughs> <laughs> through our bowels or through our just sensations? Or, and what it's trying to guide us to eat more healthy. <laughs> mm. right? So do our hormones give us messages? If we're constantly worrying and, and stressing out and, getting, and, and entertaining angry thoughts, it's going to affect our hormones. It's going to affect our physical sensations and their information. They're trying to lead us back home. Mm. But if, instead, if I start having pain or uncomfortable sensations, I now start having upsetting thoughts about the sensations, then it gets to be a vicious circle. So it's once again, the metaphor of their gifts. They're like rumble strips. They're... Yeah. Pointing us back in the right direction. They're, they're giving us information constantly. Mm. Now, I experienced that. Um, you know, if I now, I, I had this summer, I had a 19-day cold and a 24-day cold. And so I, I am a slow learner. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> I, and I forget quickly. But, I, but I, I, the difference between now and 35 years ago, and I was miserable for a number of days to where... I could barely, Linda had just had her knee surgery and all I could do was make my minimum things and take care of her as best as I could mm -hmm. and then sleep whenever I could and sleep. Mm -hmm. But when I laid there feeling miserable, I knew I, there, in the old days I would have been pissed off and resentful, mm -hmm. upset and, and I should know better or whatever or why does this happen to me at this time? And instead... I, I consider every experience I have as an opportunity to learn something mm -hmm. and allows me to just accept it and, and listen and listen and listen. Not, not with my intellect going, what's it, what's it teaching me? What's it teaching me? What's it teaching me? No, not with my intellect, but just in, go to that space of 
and there's something for me to see. I may or may not see it, but let me at least experience this quietly. My body has capability to heal me from this, or at least to do what it can. I'm going to die of something. If I'm going to die of this, maybe that's fine. But uh, if if I need to go to the doctor, I'll be I'll I'll know if I'm in a quiet state of mind. And so I go through anything, even if I have severe pain now. Uh, and I had some bouts of that in recent years where now I see what the pain was. It was trying to wake me up to something mm -hmm. that, that I wasn't, that I was, that I was not accepting in my life that I couldn't change. <laughs> mm -hmm. But so now to me, every sensation, every experience, like Sid says, the, the, the depth of that statement, if people were not afraid of their experience, the world would change. Mm. It used to sound pretty grandiose. Mm. Now, I get it at the deeper and deeper level. If people knew not to be frightened or reactive to their experience, mm -hmm. they would move through it and they would learn something from it. I love the fact that the Chinese symbol for a crisis, and you may have heard this or know mm. this, is two symbols. One is danger and the other is opportunity. Mm -hmm. I had a Chinese doctor friend, a very wonderful man. And I said, is that true? Because I heard, and he said, yes, it is. And he wrote the symbol for me. It's two symbols. One is danger. Mm -hmm. This one, he said, is the symbol of danger. And this is the symbol of opportunity. Mm -hmm. So every experience that when I have, a, I, you know, and I say this, it sounds haughty, and if I forget it, I, I, I know that there is nothing in this world or person in this world that can cause me emotional pain, except the person that's in my underwear. And the last I look, there's only room for one of us. <laughs> so I know where to look when I'm in emotional pain now, and I know where not to look. I know to allow my mind to quiet and listen that I am being given an opportunity to go through one of what Sid Banks said, that there is an infinite number of doors of understanding of these principles. And I kiddingly, you've heard me kiddingly say infinite sounds, it, last I looked in my math book, it's a really, really big number. Mm. By the way, I've, I've talked to, a friend of mine who was there when Sid talked to the PhD physicist from MIT mm. at the defense contractor. And he started telling them that although, uh, although Einstein was a brilliant, brilliant scientist, that he didn't understand infinity. And because of that, his formulas were mistaken. And he started to point out which formulas were mistaken. And my friend, who was the head of training there, jumped up and started to try to divert. He got insecure and say, oh, Sid, why don't you talk about the principles? Mm -hmm. uh, enough about physics, right? And three of the PhD physicists from MIT said, Dick, sit down. Sid is on to something. Mm -hmm. And they listened for three days mm -hmm. and invited him back, had my friend invite him back for three more days to teach them physics. Mm. <laughs> wow. Yeah, amazing. Wow. <laughs> wow. Mm. <clears throat> so that was food and hormones. Oh, the other one is medicine. Shall I do that? Yeah, well, and, and funnily enough, because you've got all kinds of experience with you know, right. medications and prescribing. So the specific question was about coming off medication. <laughs> Anything you've got for people around the domain of medication, I think. Well, the first thing is I would have people, first of all, what the medications do is they're trying to, the science, they, I, I, I mean, I, and it, I just do my best not to get haughty and to just stay great, grateful instead of, because <laughs> there's often a choice of being haughty and being grateful. When I read about, you know, they, the, all these effects of chronic inflammation, of chronic activation of the stress response, and they're trying to, the scientists are spending, they're spending, and pharmaceutical companies are spending billions of dollars trying to develop drugs 
that will counter the adverse effects of the chronic state of mental stress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Instead of helping people not live in the chronic state, because <laughs> we haven't known how to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and we blame the, but they're, they're trying to do that. So, so antidepressants, they, they try to re-regulate some of the dysregulation that is caused by the chronic state of mental stress. But in doing so, they dysregulate other systems in mm -hmm. the body because they're not made by that who was at the source. They're made by man and it's affecting all other areas of the body. And, and so, so they have side effects. Mm -hmm. They have substantial side effects, some of which can even be life-threatening. So do some people, does the antidepressants give them some relief from their symptoms? Yeah, it does. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and, and if somebody is, is having so much panic attacks that they cannot even function, they're having three or four or five panic attacks a day lasting 45 minutes to an hour, I'm going to hit them with something to stop their panic attacks. Even I mm. might use something potentially addictive, Clonopin and Xanax. And I, but I will tell them, you know, if you're willing to work with me, I'm willing to meet you where you are. But I'm going to start teaching you. I'm, I'm giving you this to give you some relief from this terrible pain and dis-ease. But I'm also going to teach you that you've been innocently creating it. And mm -hmm. I want to teach you how, that you already know how not to. And I'm going to remind you of it. And so we are this we at the most you're going to be on this medicine for 3 to 6 months. Mm. Most. And I want you to know that right now but th but they get that I care. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. And I have made the mistake of trying to teach people when I didn't have a student. Mm. And then wondering why they wouldn't listen to the old all wise Bill Pettit bullshit. Mm. But if people know that I care about them as a human being and I have compassion for their emotional pain because I've been there mm. and I know what it's like to be a human being and I'm still a human being and then they, and they get that I know something and that I'm telling them that they know it too. It's not like I'm going to teach them advanced calculus. They already know what I'm going to teach them I'm just going to help them get out of the way of it so mm -hmm. it can come to the surface and fill them up. Mm -hmm. You know, the root educate comes from the Latin to draw out, educera. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with putting something in. Mm -hmm. These principles are who we are and what we're using to create our experience. Then all I'm doing is letting people know that they unwrapping the present that they're made of mm -hmm. in their present helping them unwrap the present. They're, they didn't even do the unwrapping. I can just point to where the bows are. Bows are. So, so as, people, as people get insights into the lo a deeper level of understanding, oftentimes, interestingly, the, the medicines ca start causing them more and more side effects and symptoms. Mm. If, if they were anti-anxiety medicines, I've had people that on their own start tapering and I've told them how to do it if it, between times if it gets too strong because they're now, instead of spending 14 hours a day dysregulating their chemistry, they've, they're down to 10 and then down to eight and then down to five and then down to three and then down to one and a half and then down to 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, if they're spending 30 minutes a day in dysregulation and they used to be spending 15 hours a day, that's more powerful than any anti-anxiety medicine there is in the sure. world. And they're going, if they're still on the same amount of anti-anxiety medicine or sleeping pill that they were on here, they're going to be sleeping 18 hours a day and, and feel drunk when they're awake. Yeah. Does that make sense? It makes total sense, Bill. It, it brings up. Uh, go ahead. I was just going to say it brings us right back to what you were saying about there's one cause, which is chronic mental stress and right. one solution. Uh, exactly. Now, on the other hand, I tell Jamie, I tell people, listen, 
my goal for you, and I'm at least encouraging you to not have it as a goal either. My goal for you is not about getting you off your medicines. Mm -hmm. My goal for you is to find the deepest level of peace today that you can have, and then tomorrow, and then the next day. And wisdom will guide you, and you, you need to get a good doctor. If it's not me, if I'm, if I'm not, if I'm just your, then, then you talk to your doctor about you're learning something where you see that you're, you're spending less time in stressful thinking and upset, and it, you see that you're meeting less medicines and you need his help. You know, if somebody's on 160 or 180 milligrams of something and they end up needing five milligrams a day uh, versus 800 milligrams a day or hmm. of Thorazine, you know, to not, to not have that, then, then so be it. But I say my goal, the goal to me is just that you have the goal of finding a deeper level of peace and living mm. in the present moment with a light and loving heart, period. Mm. And the, and the, everything else will take care of itself. That's so beautiful, Bill. Thank you so much for your time and your, your generosity uh, uh, and, and all your you know, wisdom and uh, experience that you've shared with us. It's been really fantastic. I know people are going to want to find out more about you, listen to your other podcast episodes, find out what you've got going on. What's the best place for them to, to find you, to connect with you? You know, our website, the Doctors Pettit, Linda and my website, the is is, uh, is our website. Um, my individual email is just WF is in Francis, Pettit, P-E-T-T-I-T, -T -T, Junior, WF Pettit Jr. at gmail.com. And uh, that'll reach me directly as my direct email. And, uh, and I, I sometimes get, you know, really busy and, and, and don't, don't be afraid to be the squeaky wheel. I will get back to you. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so um, I, I, that, that, that would be the best way. Yeah. But our, our yeah. website, I think, will give people that are new a real feel of, of, know of what we both do where we are yeah beautiful well thanks again bill this has been really fantastic well it's been it's been so gentle and so easy jamie and i thank you and uh i thank you for the opportunity it's been fun it's it been really fun. has been thanks bill I look forward to seeing you uh in uh in june if not before uh at uh, in london take care bye-bye